Welcome to the United Leukodystrophy Presents PMD with Dr. Wolf from Amsterdam Medical Center and Dr. Bernard from Montreal Children's Hospital. Well, thank you, Tara. Um, welcome uh, to the talk on uh, Plesiosmerzbacher disease. I have no conflicts of interest uh, regarding this talk. And uh, um, just because it's my first time uh, at the ULF, or it should have been my first time at the ULF, um, I uh, wanted to share uh, where I'm from. Um, I'm uh, working as a child neurologist in the Amsterdam Leukodystrophy Center. It was founded uh, almost 20 years ago by Professor van der Knaap. Um, you probably know her because she is a regular speaker at the ULF uh, uh, meetings. And our center actually uh, works on several aspects of leukodystrophies, MRI analysis, definition of new leukodystrophies, identification of the causal genes, natural history studies. Uh, we also um, work on histopathology studies uh, of brain tissue um, to understand uh, better disease mechanisms, also using mouse models or stem cell models uh, of uh, patient stem cells. Our work is aimed at the improvement in development of treatments, and we will uh, hopefully later on this year start um, the first uh, therapeutic trials uh, for two leukodystrophies, one of them PMD, and I will talk uh, later on um, in this talk about that uh, uh, clinical trial we are planning. So disorders we focus on, we uh, uh, care for patients with all leukodystrophies, and our research foci are vanishing white matter, MLC, Alexander disease, and uh, um, other leukodystrophies um, by Mayo van der Knaap. Um, Dr. Engelen um, is working on XALD and AMN and uh, other peroxisomal leukodystrophies. And my tasks are hypomyelination, especially for age leukodystrophy and PMD, and metachromatic leukodystrophy. And that's uh, our group. Uh, we are not only clinicians. We have all also uh, neuropathologists, um, clinical um, um, geneticists, molecular um, chemists and biologists, an electrophysiologist, and a lot of very motivated uh, PhD students who help um, bring forward the field. So to, to um, understand more about uh, um, Pelletius Merzbacher disease and uh, treatment approaches, it's essential to know um, something about uh, normal myelination. And I apologize if uh, some of you have already um, um, ample experience with that, but I would like to have everyone on the same um, um, level um, to, to get further uh, in, in uh, the explanations. So uh, normal myelination actually starts already uh, uh, during pregnancy. Um, um, earlier than 30 weeks of gestational age. And at term bone, important structures like uh, the brainstem are already myelinated. And that uh, myelination follows a certain path. And around the age of two years, myelination is more or less uh, completed. Um, and that has been known already in 1920, so 100 years ago, by anatomical studies. And of course, we don't use um, um, pathology of brain slices anymore to study myelination, but we use MRI. And I will show um, how that changes with myelination in a minute. What is myelin? Myelin is produced by uh, cells called oligodendrocytes, and myelin is actually membrane wrappings around um, nerve processes we call axons. And uh, these um, myelin sheath um, consist uh, mainly of fat and also of proteins and proteolipid protein, PLP1, is the most abundant protein um, of this structure. And uh, you, you get this um, um, myelination of the axons and then the myelin still has to mature. Um, it's like a zipper um, when it gets really close together to form these tightly packed sheath um, insulating an axon. So normal myelination needs a lot of cell types, not only oligodendrocytes, but also, of course, the axon who has to be myelinated. Uh, it needs um, astrocytes providing certain factors 
stimulating oligodendrocyte development, fatty acids to make these huge amount of sheath. Um, that's actually a multiplication of the surface area of one oligodendrocyte by uh, 6,500 within only a couple of hours. It needs other factors produced by other um, cell types of the brain and also glucose and uh, thyroid hormones, iron actually all influence myelination. And the oligodendrocytes actually also play a role into providing important uh, nutrients to the axon like lactate. So everything is a very finely regulated process, uh, this myelination. And uh, um, nowadays we can follow myelination very nicely on brain MRI. You see here um, brain MRIs of a, a different ages, a neonate, six month old child, 14 month old child and a two year old child in two different uh, um, techniques. We call these techniques T1 and T2. And you see how the white matter signal, which is almost white here and dark gray here, changes during um, these first two years. Actually from dark gray to white on these T1 images and from white to almost black um, on the T2 weighted images. And uh, you, I think you all um, understand that uh, we can with this MRI technique, uh, see very nicely how far the myelination has progressed uh, in a child. So what are disorders of myelination? Uh, we call those hypomyelination or hypomyelinating leukodystrophies. And these orders, uh, disorders are actually um, defined um, as a significant permanent myelin deficit. And uh, we can um, diagnose this uh, group of disorders very nicely by MRI. Um, and oops, I go back. Um, you see here a normal child of uh, um, four years old, T2 and T1 images, and uh, um, the corresponding images of a child with hypomyelination of the same age. And you see that the white matter signal looks very much different from the healthy child and actually resembles the images of a neonate. A neonate doesn't have much myelin anyway, um, so you see that these uh, images of the hypomyelination patient and the neonate resemble each other very much. So um, the MRI is um, the mainstay of diagnosing hypomyelination. In very young children, uh, you have to repeat the MRI because uh, as you saw here, myelination progresses anyway, and myelination may just be a bit delayed, a bit later than usual. Um, so um, if you make an MRI, let's say at the age of four weeks or three months, you should repeat that um, later on, six months or uh, later, or even a little bit later to look has the myelination improved or not? So just uh, to uh, recap, myelin uh, is the insulation material of nerve fibers. Myelination meets the process of making myelin and wrapping these nerve fibers and hypomyelination is myelin deficit. And myelin is needed for um, actually um, um, giving uh, um, uh, help conducting nerve impulses much faster. We call that saltatory impulse conduction, but it's also needed for axonal protection and axonal nourishment, for example, with lactate. So the myelin has a lot of tasks um, and uh, it's, it's quite important to remember that all these tasks play a role in disorders uh, where there's not enough myelin. So hypomyelinating leukodystrophies is a group of very heterogeneous disorders. Um, and you see here um, the um, Dutch hypomyelinating patients that was, I think, uh, three years ago or four years ago. And you see also that uh, Pelletier's Merzbacher disease um, is the most frequent one in the Netherlands, at least. Uh, and for edge leukodystrophy, that's uh, this red uh, part, uh, actually should be that red part um, is uh, sorry yeah that's true uh, for age disease is that green uh, um, um, part 
And uh, you see that that uh, is uh, um, much rarer than PMD, at least in the Netherlands. And you see also that there are many other hypomyelinating disorders besides PMD and 4-H. So Pritzia Smerzbacher disease, uh, many of you um, will know that already has been described uh, quite some time ago in 1885. Um, and uh, Dr. Pelizeus, a German physician, um, described actually a large family with only affected boys. Um, and he um, um, described in a very long article, I think it's about 30 or 40 pages long, very um, precisely the clinical uh, manifestations and the clinical evolution. And uh, Dr. Merzbacher, a pathologist, um, some 25 years later, actually examined a brain tissue of uh, one of those patients and uh, already um, stated the myelin deficit and the normal nerve cells uh, in this uh, disease. So that's uh, how the disease uh, got its name. So um, the setting in the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands is a relatively small country with uh, 17 million people, about 170,000 births per year. And uh, more or less all Dutch uh, Pelitzius Merzbacher patients are referred to the Amsterdam Leukodystrophy Center. Not all of them, but most of them. They visit uh, us one to four times yearly, depending on their age, and are also um, uh, cared for by local pediatricians and physiatrists. Expert spasticity treatment, Dr. Bernard will talk later about that, um, is uh, usually done in Amsterdam. And we are also taking charge of adult patients. Our center is part of the European Reference Network for Rare Neurological Disorders. Um, so we are also able to see um, patients from other European countries. So the clinical presentation, and uh, you um, probably know more about that than I do. Um, you have the classical presentation, and that means uh, an early onset um, conatal, that means in the first uh, few weeks of life, pendular nystagmus, that's uh, these wobbly eye movements, uh, muscular hypotonia, uh, followed by uh, stiffness um, of the muscles, ataxia, that's balance problems, dystonia, that's an abnormal posture of, uh, of the limbs, and uh, then um, you, you usually see um, when the patients are um, several years old that the spasticity, the muscle stiffness actually uh, worsens. Patients, not all of them, um, but um, uh, quite a few of them have a mental retardation, but that's uh, um, less severe than the motor impairment. Uh, and uh, um, that always should be kept in mind uh, that the motor impairment doesn't predict the uh, cognitive uh, um, capacities of these patients. And in the classical form, sitting without support is usually not possible. The clinical course is um, that you have a developmental progress in the first years, um, then a stable phase, and then um, usually at the end of the first or beginning of the second decade, uh, you see a slow deterioration, progression of spasticity, increasing problems with the swallowing, and secondary complications of the handicap of these children in the second decade. Involvement of the peripheral nerves is rare, only with selected mutations, and life expectancy is difficult to predict because it depends on the severity of the disease. Actually, in the original description of Pelizeus, um, the patient survived until an age of about 30 years, um, and uh, we see many patients um, reaching that age but also patients um, with the classic form dying uh, in adolescence. So that's a uh, very um, variable. So the genetic background of Pelizeus Merzbacher disease are um, alterations of the PLP1 gene. The PLP1 gene actually encodes uh, the proteolipid protein 1. And you remember that that's the most abundant myelin protein, which is expressed in oligodendrocytes. And there are two forms of this protein, a long form and a short form. And the most frequent genetic change um, in Pelizeus Merzbacher disease is the duplication um, of the entire gene. So the entire gene is present twofold. There are also small uh, mistakes in the gene we call missense mutations. Uh, which lead to exchange of one amino acid in the protein. There are mutations where the whole gene is actually absent, 
we call that null mutation. And um, there are also um, rare cases of patients who have um, even more copies of the gene than two. Um, they have three or four or even five copies of PLP. And here you see a, a mother with uh, two X chromosomes. The PLP gene is located on the X chromosome. And you see the uh, healthy X chromosome here with one um, copy of the PLP1 gene and the affected X chromosome here with uh, three copies of the PLP1 gene. So this, pay, uh, this family has a PLP triplication. The kind of mutation um, actually helps us explain the clinical severity of uh, uh, the patients. Um, we know the um, um, prediction for quite a few mutations, but not all of them. In the severe forms, um, you have a, a, what we call conatal PMD, and these patients um, have a strider um, from birth, a severe hypotonia, and usually we no, reach no motor milestones. For example, they don't reach a head control. There are also milder forms uh, with the, uh, of PMD, sitting without support or walking with support, better to normal cognition. And the mildest form where patients learn to walk without support is X-linked um, spastic paraplegia. And uh, there are some special forms like uh, what we call HEMS, um, uh, which is called by very specific mutations. Uh, I will not uh, talk about these forms uh, today. So my talk will actually concentrate on the more severe forms of Pelletius Merzbacher disease. What we actually have already um, um, uh, thought uh, is um, that um, the amount of myelin we see on the MRI correlates with the clinical severity. So the more myelin you have, uh, the less severe is the clinical manifestations. And you might think uh, that that's uh, actually uh, quite uh, uh, easily to understand, and I agree. But when we look at other hypomyelinating disorders, for example, for age leukodystrophy, um, that correlation um, is uh, at, at least compared to PMD not so well um, because a patient with 4-H can have a very severely affected MRI but is motor-wise much less affected. But within um, Pelletier's Merzbacher disease, that correlation um, seems to be true. And uh, together with a colleague of uh, mine, um, Inga Harting, um, who is a child neuro neuroradiologist in Heidelberg in Germany, we actually um, uh, started to make an um, MRI score where we can actually measure the MRI um, um, myelin amount also in older MRIs. Uh, we don't need uh, fancy new MRI techniques to do that. And uh, uh, we saw actually that uh, when you just look at the classic and the conatal um, and the transitional PMD, so the very severe forms and the classic form, that there is a quite a good um, correlation of the uh, myelination score or the myelin amount. So you can really um, divide these two groups. And also actually the patients with the milder forms of PMD have a better myelination. You can see that here. And that's actually quite uh, an important information also for future uh, treatment trials. So what about the treatment of Pelletier's Merzbacher disease? Um, there is uh, um, at the moment only symptomatic treatment available and Dr. Bernard will talk more about that um, in the second part of, uh, of the session. Um, the problems of developing causal treatment um, um, you probably are all aware of. It's an ultra rare disorder. Mouse models are available, which is a plus for this, that disease. But experience has shown that not all data in mouse are relevant for humans. And not all treatments that work in mice work in humans. And there were already some examples in uh, Pelletier's Merzbacher disease. There is a, a still a lack of good natural history data, and these are needed to decide whether a treatment works or not, because um, when we do a trial, we don't like to use a placebo group. We would like to treat all patients in a trial, but we need a um, um, group of patients uh, which with, uh, we can compare 
um, actually treatment effects to decide whether a treatment is effective or not. There are probably different pathology mechanisms uh, in, uh, in the disease, also in Pelletier's Merzbacher disease, not only one factor. So when we um, um, treat one aspect, uh, perhaps not perfectly, other aspects might become more important. And uh, um, we can think about individual treatment approaches per disease, but we also could think uh, um, of influencing global mechanisms like inflammation or um, the integrity of the nerve processes or exodal health. So these are all things to keep in mind uh, when thinking of um, developing a treatment. So uh, what, what could you think of for Pelletier's Merzbacher disease? Um, you could think of alternative substrates for axonal nourishment, because uh, you remember that the oligodendrocytes, the myelin cells, um, should actually provide lactate to the axons. And you might circumvent that or improve that with a, a certain diets, ketogenic diet, for example. You might uh, think of treating um, inflammation, because that's present uh, in uh, Pelletier's Merzbacher disease. Um, there has already been a treatment trial um, in humans uh, with intracerebral transplantation of neuronal precursor cells, um, hoping in the hope that those precursor cells differentiate into oligodendrocytes and make myelin. This has worked in the mouse model, but um, in the um, four um, boys in whom this has been um, um, studied, there was not a clinical efficacy. Um, it was safe, but no change in uh, uh, neurological um, symptoms. In animal models, um, there has been uh, um, some uh, excitement about uh, cholesterol, curcumin, and ketogenic diet. Um, I know of uh, single patients who were treated with cholesterol and uh, curcumin, but uh, there, have, uh, um, there was no positive effect in these patients, and there are no studies so far. And uh, I think you, uh, many of you know that there are also uh, treatment trials in preparation um, where you try to decrease the amount of PLP, um, so decreasing the gene dosage with the um, gene therapy treatment, uh, and we use antisense nucleotides, uh, for example, to um, um, achieve that. Uh, in this um, approach, um, you have to be very careful um, not to knock out the PLP1 completely, because uh, the um, boys with PLP um, deletion, or what we call PLP Nile syndrome, have also considerable problems. In the beginning, they are much milder affected, but uh, later on, the clinical uh, deterioration is quite uh, significant. So uh, we hope to start with the Pelletius Merzbacher study in Amsterdam uh, um, in uh, this year. And uh, this study actually um, is based on a finding uh, not we in Amsterdam did, but uh, uh, that comes from uh, David Rorich and Marius Wernick's group. They studied um, Pelletius Merzbacher cells. And they found changes in proteins which are involved in iron metabolism. And that was actually quite uh, surprising because no one had thought to look at Pelletier's Merzbacher disease this way. So that was a very unselective approach where um, they looked at uh, the difference of um, 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 uh, um, Pelletier's Merzbacher cells and uh, healthy cells. And with this non-selective approach, the um, proteins uh, which uh, actually um, stuck out were proteins involved in iron metabolism. Gene correction normalized these changes and uh, treatment with an iron chelator, deferiprone, was successful in cell cultures of these PMD cells and also in the mouse model um, for PMD. Iron chelators are already used, uh, um, defiripona as well, is used for the treatment of certain blood disorders. Um, certain blood disorders um, necessitate many blood transfusions. 
in blood, tra uh, blood transfusions there is a lot of iron and you need to scavenge uh, this iron otherwise you get an iron overload uh, in those patients receiving so many transfusions. These um, uh, medications are used already in adults and children, but not all are registered for young children. Uh, the Diferipone is not registered for young children under the age of six years. And uh, there are um, some side effects, uh, relatively frequent uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, certainly in the beginning of a treatment. But the uh, most important uh, um, side effect is uh, in a small number of patients, uh, leukopenia, or acranolocytosis. This means low or absent white blood cells, and uh, that entails a risk of life-threatening bacterial infections. So this is a potentially dangerous side effect we have to keep in mind. Uh, so um, our study design is uh, 12 months. We first thought uh, um, doing 24 months, but that's actually quite long. And with this uh, potential serious side effects, we actually would like to keep the trial phase uh, as short as possible. And we know that within 12 months, we can see a lot of myelination if that would be uh, improved by the medication. The primary outcome uh, is motor function. And the secondary outcomes uh, would be improved myelination on the brain MRI, on the normal brain MRI, but we will also include advanced quantitative imaging to really measure the amount of myelin. We also look at exploratory outcomes uh, like biomarkers. Um, these are small um, proteins or metabolic markers in uh, the cerebrospinal fluid and blood. And what does participation mean for a patient? Uh, it means uh, MRI under anesthesia at uh, the start of the treatment and 12 months, including blood and CSF studies. At the first MRI, we would take a very small skin biopsy of two millimeters from a leg. Um, weekly capillary blood tests, which uh, can be done at home, um, because uh, you have to test for the white blood cells every week. And if these white blood cells get a little bit lower, you might have to stop um, the medication for a week or two weeks until you can restart it. And also with a, a fever, for example, an infection, you have to test the blood. And if there is, are low uh, white blood cells, you have to um, stop the medication for some time. And uh, um, every three months, uh, um, the patient has to come to Amsterdam for examination and more detailed blood tests. So why doing a study and just, not just uh, um, prescribe that medication? You would like to evaluate the real effects of this treatment, uh, which is much uh, easier in a clinical trial. Um, and uh, to be able to do that, um, um, we will um, include uh, um, the younger patients um, until the age of seven years and patients with the more severe forms, um, the conatal, transitional, and the classic forms. So these forms, uh, and you see also that um, um, when we would include also the milder forms, the MRI, for example, would be a, um, um, a, a not a good um, um, biomarker because uh, already without treatment, these patients smile much better uh, than the uh, patients with the uh, more severe forms. And those uh, uh, milder patients also have a better motor development in myelination anyway. So um, this would be very difficult to separate this from possible treatment effects. Um, why not include older patients? In older patients, we know that there's already damage of the nerve axons. Um, and that might actually um, um, make uh, normal myelination impossible. So that's the reason why we won't include um, older patients. And then there's, of course, uh, the big question, is the start of myelination possible later on in life at all? So could uh, a child of three years old or four years old start myelinating? Or is, that, is uh, this really restricted to the period from birth to two years? Actually, of course, I, I don't know for sure for Pelletius Merzbacher disease. That's something we have to, to look at um, when we do this trial. But from another um, disease, uh, we know that that uh, might uh, actually happen. 
um, because we had uh, four patients who looked in the first uh, uh, two years exactly like uh, children with Pelizios Merzbacher disease with an MRI with uh, uh, really um, not much myelin um, in the in the brain in many regions of the brain, um, also in the brain stem. When you compare that with the um, age match controls, uh, I think you see that quite uh, clearly. But uh, these children actually, um, when they were uh, a little bit older, like uh, three years, you see that myelination starts to progress. These children have a certain genetic uh, uh, um, variance in a certain gene, um, which um, uh, leads to absent myelination in the first uh, two or three years of life. But then myelination takes up and actually pro um, progresses uh, more or less fine. And uh, these patients, two of them are adults now, are doing uh, more or less fine. So we know that that's possible and we hope um, that that also means that we have the possibility to intervene in Pelizios Merzbacher disease. So I would like to sum up. Uh, Pelizios Merzbacher disease is a disease with varying severity. Uh, I didn't talk about that, but I would like to mention it. Um, female patients um, other than carriers are identified more frequently now, and there's a lot to learn about, about those, um, those patients. We need more information about the natural history for um, um, future trials, and there is uh, the study at CHOP. Um, um, you probably have heard about that. Um, there is now an MRI scoring system, which is useful for clinical studies and also retrospective natural history studies. MRI is a good biomarker, but we don't know whether there are other good blood or CSF biomarkers. Treatments are not yet available, but clinical studies are starting. Diferiprone in the future gene dose reduction and uh, treatment approaches for older or milder patients um, um, might not be aimed uh, so much at uh, better myelination, but perhaps uh, um, better at axonal health. That's uh, something uh, to, to keep in mind. Uh, um, and I would like to thank uh, um, uh, all the uh, collaborators um, and uh, uh, um, internationally, Inga Harding uh, did the MRI scoring system and uh, we have very good collaborations with uh, Dr. Bernard and Dr. Van der Fer, uh, Dr. Hobson um, for the one of the milder forms of PMD and uh, colleagues in Australia for gene finding in unclassified hypomyelination disorders. And uh, thank you um, also patients uh, and families, of course, colleagues around the world and many others who help. Thank you. So um, this, I see a question um, um, whether this uh, study is uh, possible in the US. Um, at the moment, I don't know. Um, um, it, it, uh, we will um, do um, the study in principle in Amsterdam and uh, um, we don't have the um, financial possibilities to pay for travel costs um, for patients in the US. Uh, so we uh, thought about uh, having um, a US site um, and that's uh, still not uh, uh, crystallized. Okay, I see there are no more questions, so I give uh, the word to uh, Dr. Bernard. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to be here today. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, just one aspect of uh, symptomatic uh, uh, therapy. Uh, and so, because, and I, and I, we've decided I would talk about spasticity because it's a, it's a common and significant problem with patients with Perizor's Merzbacher disease. So, um, these are my disclosures. None of them have, uh, uh, any relation to what I'm going to talk about today, except perhaps this, uh, one. So with, uh, so in 2000 and, um, I have 2017, we uh, wrote a uh, manuscript on a consensus statement for preventive and symptomatic care for patients with leukodystrophies. Um, 
and as you can see, there were like a number of collaborators on this paper uh, to help clinicians around the world care for patients with leukodystrophies. And in the following few years, uh, there has been a patient, um, a patient um, lay version of this uh, article that was done uh, and that we contributed to. It's called Living with Leukodystrophy, a guide for caring for leukodystrophy patients. So um, there is much more information about preventive and symptomatic care of patients with leukodystrophies that will not get to be dis discussed today um, that are in this uh, book. Um, so I invite you to have a look at this. So I will talk about spasticity, um, and I want to acknowledge Dr. Marie-Emmanuel Dilange, who was a former uh, mentor and uh, who is a uh, pediatric neurologist and a rehabilitation specialist who uh, has extensive ex expertise in spasticity and um, taught me a lot, so I just want to acknowledge her. Uh, so the definition of the spasticity, so it's a motor disorder characterized by abnormal increase in muscle tone or stiffness of muscles. And on neurological examination, when your doctor examines your child or examines you and you have spasticity, um, your tone is increased. So when, you, when we move the, the arms and legs, uh, the, it, it is stiffer than uh, than uh, it is uh, than and it is normally, and it's we call it velocity dependent. So if you move the limb faster, you get a catch of uh, stiffness uh, that you wouldn't get in other type of increased tone because there are other type of increased tone such as dystonia um, and Parkinsonism, but uh, these are not velocity dependent. So as clinicians, as pediatric neurologists, this is how we differentiate spasticity from other type of increased tone. And this is important because um, the treatment uh, are different for these three types of increased tone. Patients with spasticity also have brisk deep tendon reflexes. So this is when the doctor um, um, do their reflexes with their hammer and they have clonus. And this is where when the doctor uh, do a uh, rapid movements of the ankle and then there are, there are some beats uh, of the feet. And uh, the last thing is Babinski signs, uh, which is when the doctor use the hammer or his fingers or, or a pen to scratch in the, the sole of the foot. And then the, um, the first toe goes up. So um, to understand a little bit about uh, the anatomy of, spas of spasticity, so, um, so we have two hemispheres in our brain. Uh, the left side of our brain control the right side of our body and vice versa. Uh, so the prime, the, the motor cortex is, is here, and this is where uh, the information is sent down to your arms and legs to move. And so um, most uh, fibers that comes from the motor cortex here goes down and then switch side um, and, and then continues to go down until they get to uh, the spinal cord here. Here is the lumbar spinal cord for the for the legs, and as you can see, this is one axon, one neuron, and then it it has a synapse, so it, it gives a message to another neuron that we call a lower motor neuron. We call this one a an upper motor neuron. It gives um, uh, information on the lower motor neuron to act to activate the muscle. One important message that it leads it uh, to this. Um, lower motor neuron is an, what we call an inhibitory uh, message. So it, it tells the, this motor neuron to keep the muscles relaxed. Um, and then uh, if there is a problem with this motor neuron, for example, because you have hypomyelination, then this inhibitory uh, signal is, is lost or decreased, and then the muscles are stiffer. So um, this is just a, a summary of, um, of what we just said. So a healthy brain, brain sends inhibitory signals to the spinal cord, lower motor neurons, and that leads to normal tone. And then if you decrease the brain, if you, if, if it, you have a diseased brain that, brain, brain that sends less inhibitory signal to the spinal cord, lower motor neurons, then you get spasticity. So when you examine get kids with spasticity, you can see here um, a lot of the, these kids have scissoring of the legs because these muscles are stiff. 
uh, they tend to keep their arms in this position because there are specific muscles that are involved more than others with, spe with uh, spasticity. And this is the um, Babinski sign. So the doctor uh, scratched the sole of the foot and the first toe goes up. So when, you, when, when a doctor evaluates the child for spasticity, it's important to look for pain um, because it's a, one indication for treatment uh, of the spasticity. Um, it's also important to look for pressure wounds because a lot of patients with significant spasticity also are um, wheelchair bound or, um, and, and often they stay in the same position for a long time. So it's important to make sure that they do not have pressure wounds and that they're mobilized uh, uh, as much as possible. Um, tonus is important to look at, and that's uh, the, the stiffness that we look at. And again, I, I said before, it's velocity dependent. So this is when the doctor moves the arms and legs uh, in, different, uh, in different ways and different, with different speeds. Um, and then the, the pattern of hypertonia in patients with spasticity is very, um, it's, it's as I said before, so these uh, flexor muscles uh, are more affected. And then the uh, adductor here of the legs, and then you see the, the, the legs are a little bit rotated in the inside. And so these are the muscles that are more affected by uh, corticospinal tract involvement, so that leads to spasticity. The reflexes, the, the deep tendon reflexes, flexors, deep tendon reflexes or stretch reflexes are also increased. And as I said before, the plantar response is upgoing, or it's we'll also called that a Babinski sign. And the clonus, as we said before, when the doctor um, moved the, the, the foot up quickly uh, and get some beats of clonus. Uh, so that these are all um, signs of spasticity. Uh, spasticity varies and may vary in time according to the emotional state of the patient. So when the patient is anxious, uh, it, it, he, can, he or she can be more stiff. Uh, the position can change as well and whether the patient is awake or asleep. Um, so treatment of spasticity, the objectives of treating spasticity is to improve function, ambulation, and independence, because that's very important for our patients, uh, to decrease pain when there is pain, uh, to avoid complication of spasticity, so of chest contracture. Um, and so this is when a, when a child stays in the same position for very long, for a very long time and is not uh, mobilized enough. Uh, sometimes the, the, it's, it becomes difficult to, uh, to uh, stretch, stretch the legs and arms completely and to avoid uh, hip dislocations. It's also important to treat spasticity uh, to uh, make hygiene easier and diaper change easier. As I said before, uh, I'm going to go back. Um, uh, these muscles are more uh, affected, the muscles that make the legs uh, go together. We call that adductors. Um, and so it may be difficult with a lot of spasticity to, for example, change the diaper. So this would be an indication for treatment and also to facilitate rehabilitation. So how do we treat spasticity? Uh, rehabilitation is key. Uh, so physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and physiatry are, uh, are key, um, are key um, um, health, uh, uh, are key people to be able to help uh, treat your spasticity or the spasticity of your child. And really, the, the most important thing to remember is stretching is extremely important. So stretching, stretching, stretching to avoid contractures. Um, and then uh, the physiotherapist would give exercise and the whole team would recommend some equipment to improve functions such as orthosis or a walker. Um, would also make sure that the kids that are wheelchair bound are have a standing frame to uh, remain, uh, to, especially for bone health. Um, the main medication that we use for uh, to treat spasticity is called baclofen. Uh, so it's a medication that uh, loses the muscles. It acts in the um, on the lower motor neuron and it makes it uh, less active. This is why it treats spasticity. What is what's important to know about baclofen is um, for the patients that have um, have difficulty holding their head. Uh, 
it will it so it does uh, loosen all the the muscles of the body including the muscles that are important for trunk uh, so the for trunk and and head control and so uh, if if there is problem with holding the head and trunk sometimes it may be difficult to increase the dose of baclofen um, there are other side effects, but we're not going to go through them. Uh, then uh, something we used a lot in Montreal, uh, the injection of botulinum toxin or phenol in uh, the regions that are more problematic for the spasticity, uh, including the adductor muscles or for diaper changes, for example. And then there's surgical uh, options. So if there are uh, orthopedic problems lead because of the spasticity, if they're contractors, the orthopedic surgeon sometimes can uh, do surgeries. And also uh, there are a neurosurgical approach, which are selective dorsal rhizotomy or baclofen pump. Um, we use these in selected patients. It's important to have a multidisciplinary team involved in uh, the decision uh, whether or not to uh, to perform these um, these uh, these uh, surgeries. Uh, so I want to thank the patients and their family. This is a meeting that we've done in Montreal in 2018, and uh, the, co co the colleagues from which we uh, learn uh, a lot. I've learned a lot over the years, um, and this is the funding that we've had over the years. And I also want to thank my team. I haven't put pictures of her of them uh, today, but uh, I had I gave two more talks yesterday, and I had I uh, I put pictures of them yesterday. So um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So we have uh, almost 15 minutes for questions. So please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, and if you have any discussions that you would wanna have as well, we would be, will, would be uh, happy to answer uh, and discuss with you. Well, I see a question uh, about ketogenic diet. Uh, perhaps I try to answer that. Um, it has not been uh, done in uh, patients. It has been uh, um, tried out only in the mouse model. Uh, so we don't know at all whether that uh, is effective and whether that would be effective uh, uh, just for um, patients with axonal um, involvement. So the older patients, um, that's uh, something um, um, we might uh, think actually also of uh, looking further into that question, but uh, designing a clinical trial uh, for the, this will not be so easy, I'm afraid. If I may add, uh, there is also significant side effect of ketogenic diet that needs to be taken yeah. into account. Yeah. So I would not recommend to do that without and outside of a clinical trial. And, and, in a set, and it had to be a center that's used to do clinical tri trials, uh, clinical trial, a ketogenic diet, and to follow the side effect. Mm -hmm. So I see here that the, uh, this patient is on a modified ketogenic diet uh, with, with a very low ratio for other purposes. Um, that's uh, very interesting. So perhaps uh, you um, um, could share. Um, uh, any uh, possible um, changes in the PMD condition in your child? I think it's also very important that we uh, collect uh, data of uh, anyone um, um, using uh, this or that uh, treatment. Um, it will always be difficult to decide on efficacy if uh, 
you do that outside uh, clinical trials um, because there are a lot of uh, um, factors um, making it uh, sometimes impossible to decide whether some something has an effect or not. And perhaps I add for the clinical trial we plan in Amsterdam, that will be a small trial, not a, not a trial with a huge number of patients. Um, um, that has also to do with the uh, financing. Um, so we will be able only to see clear effects. Um, if there is a subtle effect uh, on, on the disease, we will miss it. But um, perhaps uh, that's not uh, um, um, not so bad because if effects are very subtle, uh, we perhaps might uh, wait for better treatments, uh, which are actually being developed uh, um, at the moment. So I see that uh, that patient has been uh, um, uh, started on the ketogenic diet uh, because of uh, uh, at least suspected epilepsy. And we know that the ketogenic diet um, uh, is effective in some uh, patients uh, with epilepsy. Yeah, so there was no, uh, um, there was improvement, but uh, there were also other m measures taken. So it's difficult to say um, whether it was the diet uh, who um, led to uh, um, improvement of the seizures um, and uh, um, the diet is well tolerated in this uh, particular patient who has also very good follow up. Okay, so we read here that there were some uh, general um, improvements also, um, less vomiting and uh, improved uh, feed tolerance. And uh, um, this patient uh, actually receives a, a real food instead of the formula, which is uh, a, a, a quite an achievement, I think. Perhaps so this is a question for you, Genevieve, the next one. So do you have an opinion on physical therapy and frequency in PMD as the child ages? Is it usual for the parents to take over all physical therapy stretching as the child gets older? Um, so I'm not, so I can speak with, for, for, for Quebec, Canada. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the kids with uh, neurodegenerative diseases are not followed uh, regularly in um, in the rehab centers. They're seen as needed, and exercises are given to the parents for them to do. Um, ideally, uh, I guess everybody would be followed regularly by an OT, a PT, and a rehab in a rehab center. But I think, in turn, because of the limited resources, the rehab centers, at least in Canada, focuses on patients that are going to. Uh, improve, um, not on maintaining maintenance of um, skills. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the burden uh, goes on to uh, the families. But it...
I'm sorry. I, I had I smiled because my my youngest son just sneak into the room <laughs> and uh, and said hello. So he says hello to all of you. <laughs> Say hello back to him. Uh. <laughs> So we have um, five minutes left. Um, so if you have any other uh, questions or comments or perhaps uh, topics you'd like to discuss next year, um, please let us know. Yeah, so um, uh, Mrs. Schmiedel commented that uh, it's even more significant after 21. It's the same uh, here in Quebec. It's uh, actually the services are even more difficult after the age of 18. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the same in the Netherlands as well. Um, the transition is uh, still a problem, although um, we are in the um, position that we can uh, actually, um, as uh, most of child neurologists in the Netherlands are also adult neurologists, uh, that we usually um, um, continue seeing our patients um, uh, when they are still adults. but. Uh, um, the um, treatment intensity, uh, especially of physiotherapy, um, speech therapy, is actually uh, decreasing. So you, uh, you, there was a comment about having sleep disturbances. Um, uh, perhaps Nicole, you can, uh, Dr. Wolf, you can add, you can complete this. But uh, I, in my experience, a lot of kids with uh, leukodystrophies have sleep disturbances. A lot of ki kids with chronic diseases uh, have sleep disturbances. In the case of patients with um, with neurological diseases, it could be there, there's different reason, but it's usually a combination of anxiety and in some patient uh, neurological uh, um, uh, neurological irritability, which we can help with some medication or some and some life adjustment. Yeah, I I completely agree, uh, Dr. Bernard. Uh, we see that uh, as well in patients with leukodystrophies. Um, sometimes it's a uh, um, the spasticity, which may be painful, um, hip dislocation or scoliosis. Uh, um, sometimes it's just a general irritability, and sometimes it's uh, indeed uh, helped by lifestyle changes. Um, so I don't think it's specifically related to hypomyelination. Um, um, there was also a question about feeding tubes. Um, they are common in uh, in Pelletier-Smalzbacher disease, especially in the children with the um, more severe forms. I think uh, all conatal patients I know have uh, um, feeding tubes. Uh, and uh, um, the patients with the classic form, um, it, it depends. Um, but um, certainly um, at the end of the first decade, most of them will have a feeding tube as well. We have uh, only one and a half minutes uh, left. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank Dr. Wolf for her excellent talk. And um, we would uh, be very happy to see you again uh, next year, hopefully in person. Um, so stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye.